Happy Sunday, everybody. It's Robin with Creativity RV, and behind me is beautiful Natarts Bay, Oregon. It's a beautiful day out here. You can see people are enjoying the water and clamming, and there's a bunch of harbor seals here, and it's really a beautiful place if you get a chance to come out here and visit. But I'm going to run inside right now and do your Sunday morning view queue, where I answer all the best viewer questions from the view queue the last Sunday. And I'll tell you today we've got another great set of questions, like inverses versus converters, potable versus is potable tow cars and all kinds of other stuff so I'm gonna run inside now so you guys can hear me and get to all the best viewer questions Good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful summer, and I hope you're all out there enjoying it. I know I am. Isn't the Oregon coast beautiful? Thank you to everybody on Facebook and Instagram that have given me so many great suggestions of places to visit. Nate Hearts Bay, where I am now, was a suggestion from a viewer like you, so I appreciate it. Hey, before I get to the questions today, uh, please go over to the community tab on my channel because I have a poll going right now. I want to know how many of you are on the road, how many of you plan to go on the road. Let me know in the poll and in the comments. I appreciate it. In last week's view queue, I answered a viewer question about how inverters work, and I described it like a Rosetta Stone where the inverter basically takes the language that your battery speaks and then translates it into a type of language that your 110 household appliance outlets use. And that went great, but a few of you asked what a converter was. And I'll tell you, I got the best comment from somebody that explained it just as well as I could have. So I'm going to go ahead and give that guy props right here. Writing the Road 1 said... The converter transforms AC voltage to DC, and an inverter transforms the DC to AC. And then he said this, which I thought was genius. Both transform voltage, but in opposite directions. Converter is needed to charge the batteries from shore power, and the inverter is needed to use the batteries to run items in the RV when you're boondocking. So yeah, when you're boondocking and you're not hooked up to shore power, the inverter makes some of your outlets work on your regular household appliance outlet. That's one tin. But if you go out to an RV park, let's say, you have a power tower outside that you plug into, and that actually comes into your RV through a converter, which will charge your house batteries. So again, they do the same thing, like my friend here says, they just um, translate the power, but in two different directions. So I wanted to give that guy props because I thought it was really great. Oh, you guys, I have to turn on a fan. I know it's not great for the noise in here, but sorry, had to do it. It's getting too hot in here. You guys know how it goes. So the first question comes from Miss My Grandpa Al1. Uh, she says, first, I want to say thank you. Thank you for saying thank you. And she wants to know if I wish I had a tow vehicle. And then she goes on to say, it does take more time, I know. I think maybe a van may be best for me because I want to get around. And it's so funny that you ask this right now because, you know, I chose a B plus and now a C that were both around 25 feet because I want to be able to get into towns easily and gas stations and smaller spaces. But, you know, to be honest, I don't break camp. It's just still too difficult are too time consuming to break camp and run into town. So what I mean is, you know, you have to put in your slide, you have to organize everything, make sure everything's secure, and um, take all your stuff that's sitting outside and put it inside. That's breaking camp. And I don't wanna do that to run into town. So I find that I don't go into towns or let's say museums or hiking trails or things like that that I want to as, as much as I'd like to. So. You know, in my next rig, who knows? I might go 
to something that can tow a little bit better, like a Class A with a tow car. I know people that love that. Or I might go to a fifth wheel. Uh, I have been doing a lot of research lately on what travels better in the wind, uh, what's the safest, and what's the easiest to hook and unhook. So far, I'm leaning towards a fifth wheel if I change my rig again. Don't get worried. I'm not making any changes right now. But uh, I do think about this. And so if you guys could give me your input on this, I would really appreciate it for people that have had more than one type of rig. Um, I like the idea that the weight of a fifth wheel goes into the bed of the truck and the pivot point is right there. And I've seen people hook it and unhook it. It only takes a couple of minutes. I have seen some people that have a towed, meaning a tow car, like on the black of their Class C. And um, that looks difficult if it's not four wheels down. And um, sometimes that can look like more of a hassle depending on what type of a car you're towing. So yeah, to be honest, I wish I did have a tow car. I have a friend that I travel with sometimes that has one. And um, God, it's so nice to be able to just run into town and do laundry, do grocery shopping without having to break camp and go into town. But you know, it's a trade-off for me. Right now, I'm solo on the road, and so this is a good size for me. Uh, because I work and I have a pet, I'm not sure that a van would be the right size for me. I think that might be too small for me. But um, this is the smallest I could go without being in a van. Um, if I went any bigger than this, I would definitely have a tow or a towed car. Please let me know what you guys think. Next question. Okay, Inner Peace Coaching said, I'm wondering when book number three, Seducing Sienna, is coming out. Thanks, Carrie. And then Lisa said, I was wondering where your paintings are. I bet they're beautiful. Well, thank you so much. So look, you guys know when I first hit the road, I made my living by writing romance novels. And um, I plan to write seven in a series called the American Dream Love Story Series, where women chase their dreams and find love. And um, the first two I wrote, I loved. I thought they were fun to write. Seducing Sienna was supposed to be out over a year ago. It's half done, but um, I got sidetracked <laughs> by doing all this video stuff and writing the book, Be a Nomad, Change Your Life. I don't know, Carrie. I might go back and finish it, but I'll tell you right now, I've got three other books in the work that are nonfiction for you guys. And, you know, I've been working on a suspense series um, that's RV related that sh I'm hoping is going to come out next year. But all of that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And so for now, Seducing Sienna has been put up on the shelf, as has my painting. You know, I thought I would get in my RV and paint more than I am. But I'm so excited about all the stuff that I have going um, for you guys here and on Instagram and Facebook and the books and the blog has a lot of content coming out on it. So head over there if you haven't already and please subscribe. Um, so I haven't had time to paint, but you know, I get this question a lot. So I went back on the road to try and find what I had pictures of. And I'll show you guys a couple of my paintings that I did a few years ago. Um, here they are. <laughs> I use watercolors and I love that and I have watercolors in my mind that I want to do uh, that I just don't have time to do yet but I see myself maybe in five years sorry the boy's into something what are you doing boy I see myself in about five years doing something like that uh, more I may paint full time in a few years who knows I can do whatever I want on the road and as usual there's somebody staring at me out the windshield I hate that I got a few questions like this. Debbie Lighty, Liddy one says, good morning. Good morning. Cannot wait for your video about your new Wi-Fi hookup. Okay, a few of you asked me about this because I did a video about three weeks ago now showing you guys the best internet Wi-Fi setup I've ever seen. Um, I just happened to interview a couple that was in um, a Class B and they had this great setup. I did buy the mini version of their setup and I've been on the hunt for cell plans, basically data only internet plans that I can use inside of this router that I got. I have found that and now I am working on it and troubleshooting it. I really want to test it and do a really solid video for you guys showing you how it works and what the cost is and all that stuff. It should be out in about two weeks, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for all the questions on that. I think Katie Travel, Katie Travel with Woody said, I have already purchased my Class A and love the layout, the tank sizes and all the outlets, but the times I've camped with it and I've driven, I felt really uncomfortable. I really thought I would get used to it, but now I'm starting to question my choice. 
I'm an impulsive type and doing research but telling myself to give it 12 months before making a decision. Question, how do you find the used pleasure ways, leisure travel, or Nexus Vipers? I've searched and searched and it seems most of the dealers only show new stock. Okay, I have also done a ton of research on this and I'll tell you, every brand is totally hit or miss. Like for example, I couldn't stand my leisure travel van. It just literally fell apart around me. Um, but I know other people that love their leisure travel van. So, you know, I think it depends on um, luck of the draw, like which one you get off the floor. I will tell you that I have never had anybody tell me a bad thing about a pleasure way. If you have a pleasure way and you did not like your experience with that rig, please do put it in the comments below for this person so she knows that. Um, the Viper I'm not familiar with. I haven't interviewed anybody who's had that or heard anything about that. I think your idea to wait a year before switching is good you know maybe give it six months i know most nomads change the type of rig they have and i know people that have had every type of rig and i think that will be me <laughs> because i don't plan to stop this anytime soon and i do want to go out and drive uh i can see people unhooking their boat behind me i hope that's not too distracting but i'm here on the bay and everybody's taking off their canoes and getting their clamming gear out but I do see myself having every type of rig. I'm planning to drive a fifth wheel on a Class A and take you guys along with me while I do that soon so I can tell you how all the different rigs handle differently. I can tell you in my first Class B, that was 25 feet, every time I took a right-hand turn for the first two weeks or so, I went over the curb. And I've heard people say this in every type of rig and then I never did it again. So you might end up being more comfortable. But also, most everybody I've interviewed changes their rig once they've had some time on the road because then they know what their needs are. Some people like to move every couple days. Then a van might be good for you. The thing about a van is you do have to break camp more often and go into town because you need to dump your trash or you need to get food because maybe you only have a cooler or something like that. So when you have a van, you generally can't camp as long in one place. And if you go bigger from that, like my size, I can stay 10 days, two weeks without having to break camp, but it's not as easy for me to get into town. So everybody put your comments down below. Um, as far as finding rigs, I would go to rvt.com or rvtrader.com because the first listings that you'll see are the new ones. But then if you keep looking, you can see the used ones that are for sale by owner. And then you can also get a gauge on how much your new purchase might depreciate or your used purchase might depreciate over time. So you never know what might happen in the future. I'll tell you this though, if I were um, on the road full time as a couple, like if Doug ever came with me, I would go bigger. Um, I know that there are couples that do it in a B, um, but I would prefer to have a little more room if I were full-time with another person. A 25-footer is just about right for me and one animal. Wendy Nichols 3 says, I have a question about campfires. How do you start yours? I'm full-time and have campfires about four times a year because I have no skills. <laughs> Can you help? Okay, Wendy, listen. My friend Carol, who I interviewed, we actually met in a Cracker Barrel parking lot. Um, I camp with her pretty frequently. Um, haven't seen her in about five weeks, but she is the queen of the campfire. She is under Boldly Go RV. You can find her on Instagram or on YouTube. She's got a few videos just for fun of her cats and stuff. But check out her videos on her fires. One thing I learned from her is how important the structure of the fire is. And I wish I had some footage of it to show you. Now I knew that air was important. You will kill a fire if you mix it around so there's no air or you stack the wood so there's no air. That's why you'll see like teepee fires like this. Um, that a lot of people do because air gets in there. Um, if you can't get any air, put some rocks down and put the wood on top of it, and that will give you some air pockets. Now, you guys know I have a fire every morning if I can. I go outside and I read a book. And um, what I learned from Carol is she actually will stack two big logs. She likes a big fire, though. Two big logs like this over maybe some rocks or just on the ground, and then two logs on top of that that are pretty big. And then the center area she fills with kindling and she lights that kindling with a fire starter and she gets that going really good and then she puts other little ones on top of it. So this big fire burns out to the big pieces and that works amazingly well. Though when I'm with Carol, we do go through firewood pretty quickly. And it's funny you should mention this because for about four months now, I've been trying all kinds of different homemade fire starters 
And um, at some point I'm going to do a video on this, but the ones you buy in the store are so expensive. So when you go to the laundromat, grab the dryer lint out of the dryers because dryer lint is one of the most flammable things. And I save that in a big Ziploc bag and use it as a fire starter. You can also use candle wax on just about anything. You can drip candle wax on like really dry pine cones, or you can drip it on, you know, the cardboard center of a paper towels or toilet paper, or I've done this. You can shove lint inside of those, drip candle wax on the top, and it'll keep it burning forever. I mean, you just stick it in there. Also, oranges are flammable. Didn't know if you know that. Rubbing alcohol is flammable. Um, flour is flammable. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to actually do a video and tell you guys what's flammable inside of a rig because it's really interesting. Like, for example, um, you shouldn't be using regular household cleaners inside your RV because they can be flammable and there's propane and gas in here. But that's for a later date. Um, the other things you can use as fire starters are Doritos. Believe it or not, they burn. And, you know, the stuff you get at the store. I think the key is stacking it right and also leaving air pockets. Yeah, girl, if you like a fire, just do it until you get the hang of it because that's one of my favorite things. And I'm a morning fire person. I like to get up, you know, early and go outside when everything is waking up and the birds are singing and the flowers are like stretching up towards the sun. I like that better than campfires at night, but each his own. What do you like? Tell me. Vicky One says, you have the most informative videos. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. I'll be going mobile at the end of the month. Do you have any advice on how to calm my nerves? Ha ha. Um, booze? I'm kidding. Don't drink and drive, Vicky. Um, yeah. You know what you're feeling is probably excitement. I find that, you know, we're so dulled in our ordinary lives that sometimes we can't discern those feelings. I know when I first hit the road, I felt what I thought was anxiety but it was really excitement. So yeah, there's gonna be a mix of that. Embrace it, enjoy it. And like I was saying to the last lady, the more that you drive, the more that you do stuff, the easier it's gonna be. You know, if you want to, in the beginning, just go a short distance, go to an RV park, go to a national forest campground where there's other people. I find that RV people are some of the friendliest people in the world. It also changes by geography. Some places they're like so friendly, you're like, this is weird. In other places, nobody looks at each other and that's weird. But 80% of the places I go, everybody's super friendly. If you have a problem, there'll be somebody there to talk to generally. You make friends really fast when you're camping. And um, I wish you Godspeed and good luck on the road. What an exciting time for you. Let us know in the comments for the next VUQ how it went. Um, we'll all live vicariously through you. Okay, now. This is an important one, and I get this question a lot. Phyllis Chansey has a question about health insurance, and you guys know that I have an entire video dedicated to health insurance. I think it's in my you know top 10 video start here playlist. Um, if not, I did it about eight months ago. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not licensed in insurance anymore. I used to be. I used to be licensed in health insurance um, also. And so I'll, give you some ways to maneuver around, but I cannot give you any advice on coverages myself because I'm not licensed. But um, I get this question a lot about all these new companies that are shooting up since some of the Affordable Care Act rules were changed about a year ago. A lot of new companies have been sprouting up. So Phyllis Chansey says, we are looking at joining the Road Life Project. It's $5.99 per month to join in on health insurance. Okay, well, I'll tell you, I had never heard of Road Life Project, and you know, for the book, I did a lot of research about health insurance and just um, added new things and checked all the information I had um, for the most recent book update, which was in June. So I had not heard of them. They did not come up in my research. Um, so I'll tell you, I went into their website, found as much information as I could for you, watched a webinar, and I don't know. I think you're saying $5.99 is what it costs to join Road Life. And then through their membership, you have access to health insurance. And I'm going to go like this. Because here's what I think is important after looking at that website that you look into. And the same is true for any of the other places that people are going. The webinar that they had, you know, was a sales webinar, was a sales pitch, trying to get people to call the 800 number to talk to 
an agent that could go through their needs and advise them and give them a product. Now, they don't sell all products, so I don't know if you'd be getting the widest range of information or choices. I don't know. Maybe you do. But they do say in the webinar, all the healthcare options listed, they may not have. So that's one thing, right? The other thing is that you have to actually join their website, as far as I could tell. If I'm wrong, somebody let me know. You have to join to get access to their company that they work with that does the health insurance. Road Life Project doesn't do health insurance. They're partnering with another company who's going to write that insurance for you. What I'd want to know is where do you find your declarations package or your description of benefits? If I could have seen that, I would have read it for you <laughs> and tried to help you decipher it. Um, there was no information about the actual product. They said something about it being a $5 million lifetime cap, but then they said there were three different plans. They also talked about um, like critical illness plans and accident plans, and that led me to believe that they might be an indemnity kind of a plan. It may not be real insurance. So, for you guys out there, health insurance as a quagmire, it is difficult. But if you go to my health insurance video or into my book, I have tons of links that you can go to to find out what's available in your state, rules for the ACA, other options. I think I have several ways to get health insurance on there. And one thing that I want you to think about is that it says that World Life Project has a health plan. That may not be health insurance. They don't have the verbiage qualified plan. Now maybe they just left out the word and they do have a qualified plan. But a qualified plan means that it meets the minimum requirements of the Affordable Care Act. Meaning that like um, all kinds of things are covered as a minimum. Like let's say you need to go to rehab. <laughs> it's like the last lady you're drinking to calm down. Just kidding. The Affordable Care Act set out some minimum standards that they wanted health insurance to have because there were some fly-by-night kind of unregulated companies out there that were hurting people. Um, but a lot of people don't want to pay for all the stuff that is minimum coverage in the Affordable Care Act. So one, find out if they're a qualified plan, meaning that they meet the requirements of the Affordable Care Act minimums. If it's not qualified, then it may be something called a limited benefit plan, which has coverage, but it's way, way, way reduced coverage. Like the amount of things that are covered are crazy low. So you might think, oh yeah, I'm paying this great rate and I don't have to pay for all the stuff that's in Obamacare, but then you find out you have some kind of cancer that's not covered or something like that. So I don't know because we can't see the coverages, right? They may be offering you something called a fixed indemnity plan, which means they pay you a set amount for something that happens like you break a leg, you get a thousand dollars, you get diagnosed with cancer, you get $5,000, but it doesn't cover your insurance, your medical bills, it doesn't pay the hospital. They literally cut you a check. Now, those types of plans are great if you have a regular health insurance plan and you have like a $10,000 deductible, which a lot of them do. Some people choose to take the really high deductible on their health insurance plan so their monthly premium is lower and then they pay 30 bucks a month for one of these indemnity plans to offset that deductible if something happens. See, this is why you need to really talk to an agent um, that has a full range of stuff that you can get. Or go to healthcare.gov and talk to one of their counselors also. I'll tell you this though, if you're going to go with Road Life Project and you become a member and you call that health insurance broker, which is probably who you're going to be working with, um, find out where their plans are registered and then look up the insurance commissioner's website for that state. So let's say they're registered in Colorado and you're a resident of Colorado. You can go over to the insurance commissioner website in any state and you can find out what usually what people think about that, what their ratings are, if there have been complaints. They have to file with the insurance commissioner. So they'll have all their coverages there. Call and talk to an insurance commissioner helpline person. I find that, you know, they answer in about three minutes. Most of them have live people and they're there to help you as a consumer. So that's a way to protect yourself. Get the coverages in writing and actually read it. 
and see what the difference is between that and another plan and then make your decision. If you do go with it, please do come back and say how much it was, what plan you chose, you know, if you were able to get the benefits packages that tell you what's covered, and I will tell everybody in a future view queue. Okay, and finally, you guys, I'm going to tackle this. Potable versus potable, because Zephyr8281 said, LOL, I crack up every time you mispronounce potable. Love your videos. You look awesome and happy. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so look, I was pronouncing it potable. Then I went to my very first campground and a ranger told me it was potable. And then I did a video called Water, 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 Six Ways to Find Water, which you can find in my playlist. And somebody got on me for calling it potable. They said it was potable. So I actually did do some research in this after your question. Because no matter what way I say it, somebody gets on me in the comments. So it turns out that the proper pronunciation is potable, like P-O-H, table, potable. And uh, it's because it comes from the French word potare. And uh, the sticky part is that there are other places like in the UK that say potable, although some places say potable. And a lot of our military says potable, like P-A-H, potable. So you hear a lot of people say potable, and then people that say potable want to say potable, like me, and then potable to potable. You say potable, I say potable, potable, potable. You know, let's not call the whole thing off. Let's just say it the way we want to say it. But thank you for making me look it up, but it actually is potable. And um, I'll tell you, if I run into somebody in the military and they say potable, I'm not going to correct them. Um, I just think that there's different ways to say it, but the correct way, in fact, Zephyr, is potable. Thank you for telling us all. So that's it, you guys. If you have a question that you'd like to ask me for the next VQ, please do put it in the comments down below and I'll get to it. And please, if you do have a comment um, or a remark about something that was discussed in this video, let's all learn from each other and put it down below. Don't forget to go over to the community tab on my channel to answer my latest poll question, which is, are you on the road yet full time? Check me out on Instagram, Facebook, subscribe to my blog. There's a lot of great content coming out there as well. I hope you're all having happy travels out there this Sunday and be free.